First, I'd like to start off by saying how grateful I am to be standing up here tonight. I'd like to thank Steve for giving me the opportunity to thank you all for listening. Um, most of all, though, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior for, for His grace. Because without Him, I won't be standing here. Without that, I wouldn't be standing here. Today I get to, serve, get to serve the Lord as Steve is so fond of saying, and what a blessing it is. You see, there's a few things I've always enjoyed in my life, and running my mouth is one of them. Okay? Yeah, in case any of you did not notice that. Never noticed? Never. Really? Yeah. Never. Nobody ever seen that? No, nobody noticed that. Right. Well, that I thought I'd let you all know just in case you did. All right? But I, I come to find out that a lot, you know, you say a lot of words in your life. And, you know, 70% of them are wasted. 30% of them have meaning, and maybe 5% are about the Lord. And then 5% are what really matters. You know, 5% are the most important words you can share. The thing that's a blessing to me is when I get to get up here and do these sermons. You know, and it's been a while. It's been a while since I've gotten up here. You know, I, I, I do read the Bible regularly. All right? And I do study. I also, you know, I'm a truck driver, so there's a lot of times I'll pop my YouTube and pop my sermon as a little bit my day. And one thing I, I've learned is the more I learn about the Lord, the more I want to learn about the Lord. The more I read the Bible, the more I, I, I study the Bible, the more I want to share the Bible. Now, and that's a real blessing to me because as you see, I'm starting to develop this relationship where I love the Lord immensely. And I love learning about the Lord and I, I have that desire to learn about the Lord. And then here's a mixture of the blessings. Is not only do I get to stand up here and talk about the Lord, which I've already decided that talking is one of my favorite things to do, but discussing the Lord is one of my favorite things to do. And not only can I do it, but I am commanded to do it by the Lord. You know, when I read the Bible, I kind of feel like Indiana Jones. You know? You know, searching out the whole, like, I got Braves of the Lost Ark, you know, he's always out searching, he's always searching in some kind of book. You know, I, I, I get to say, to where I'm I like, in my mind, I've uncovered some great secret, like some secret unknown knowledge, you know. And it is to me, it is to you, it is, a, you know, it is a secret to me because I'm now just, I'm just developing that. I am just coming across it. You know, I, I kind of forget the fact that, you know, that, other people read this book and probably read the same things I have. You know. But every time, and it never ceases to amaze me that I can read the same passage three times and come up and, and learn something new every time I read that passage. Some subtle story, some subtle dismissed story that I missed the first time around. And sometimes it's real easy for me to see the big picture of the Bible story. And, and I get to read it so fast that I skip over all the subtleties that are in there. Well, so, so with that in mind, you know, Sunday was Easter. You know, we all have a good Easter, if I have a good Easter. Amen. You know, and here's one thing that I, I found myself thinking about while I was going about my studies. Is this Easter celebration doesn't end at Easter. You know, during these days, and I, I, I don't know, you know, the dates are probably not specifically right, you know. You know, but during this time, you know, from, this, from the resurrection to Christ going to heaven, there was a time frame in there where he visited with people. He showed himself amongst people. Hundreds of people saw Christ after he was crucified and after he rose from the dead. So what I'd like to do is paint a picture a little bit. 
Jesus had fulfilled scripture by being crucified on the cross and dying for our sins. Correct? Alright? He was laid with the chief of Joseph of Arabia's. Alright? His body was prepared for burial. Saturday went by, Sunday, Sabbath went by. So let's, let's turn to chapter 20, in, uh, John chapter 20 in our Bibles. Pick it up there. John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. He, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there. Now I'd like to hold up there for just a second. We know from the other books of the Bible that Mag Mary Magdalene was not alone when she went to the tomb, but she had other women with her. Okay. They make the journey, journey from you know, from the town to the, to the tomb. And the stone that sealed the tomb had been rolled away. She then ran and came upon Peter. And she tells Peter and John, someone has stolen Jesus' body. Alright? She didn't right away speak of the resurrection. She spoke about the, somebody stealing the body. The body. The thought of resurrection hadn't crossed her mind yet. It hadn't come to her yet. All right. Now, in response to that, John and Peter take off. They, they, don't, they don't go to the authorities to have them go and investigate. They go and do it themselves. They take on that journey and they run there. Now, here's, a, here's something I found interesting about. John never refers to himself by name. But as the other disciple that Jesus loved. But we know this is John speaking of himself. Right. Now here's another thing I find very interesting. John is so humble as to not mention himself by name, but he just cannot keep it to himself that he outran Peter. Okay. I find that interesting. And that's, you got to think about that. That's from all history. That's from that day when he wrote this, every one of us will read this and know that he beat John or beat Peter in a foot race. Okay? Man, I gotta tell you something. I like this John guy because that's a big I just couldn't pass up. Alright? And that's just my nature. Alright? But for whatever the reason, John pulled up short. Alright? John got there, he beat Peter there in the foot race, right? He read that, but he pulled up short. He didn't go into the gym. He stooped in, he looked down, seeing what was going on there, but he stopped. He didn't enter. All right? Now, I got kind of a question in mind. One thing I like to do with the Bible, when I'm reading these stories about the Bible, I, I try to insert myself over there and see, see what I would be thinking. Okay? And when i got to insert myself in the Bible, and there's another person in this, and by the way, in this case it's Peter and John, it turns out to be Jeff and Carl. Alright? See, Carl, Carl's my queen boo. He's my running mate. He's the guy, if you're going to see me out and about, more likely Carl's not going to be too far away from me. Okay? We do a lot of things together. And it, it reminds me, you know, so my, my thoughts get to pondering this stuff, wondering about this. Why did John pull up short? Why didn't he go into the tomb? Well, Carl will tell you that when we got to crawl into a basement or underneath a trailer or something like that, who goes first? Carl does. All right. Carl is a little bit older than I am. 
Well, all right. And in some times, some instances, I'm timid. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. All right. And I can't help but think that God got there. And he was afraid of what he was going to discover. He was apprehensive. He didn't want to go in. But Peter, on the other hand, come charging up. Right in. All right. I, and I, I took a lesson from this. You know, it's just a little subtle lesson. But you got two disciples there. One's faster than the other. The other one's bolder and enters right away. And then John followed Peter into the tomb. I got, I got to thinking about that. And I think about how much my relationships with the other people in this church, with my other Christian brothers and sisters, influence my life. When Peter entered that tomb, John followed. The support of two Christian brothers took away the fear of John. And he came in with him. And they experienced this together. They, they came across, you know, the uh, first shelf goes along and tells us how they discovered the linens laying there. All right? They saw the linens laying there and the handkerchief was folded. They were the head with them the head coverings were folded. And you take this, you know, the first thought was somebody stole this, the very important matter of fact, thought was somebody had stolen his body. But there was something different about the scene that told him that. Something different. The linens and the rabbits, the mummy and stuff, was laying right there. And you got, you know, these, from what I studied, the way these tombs were made is there a cavern, basically a cave, and they would have slabs carved out. They had like a slab on this side and a slab on that side. And they would mummify these bodies, put them in put head wrappers, you know, anoint them with spice to preserve the body. And then after time, as the body would decay, they would put them into cartons or some kind of container or urns and, and leave it for the next person, you know, for the next family member that passed away to be a shot there. Okay? But if a grave robber would have came in, it's doubtful that they would have done, they would unwrap the body and beat the way the women's done. Okay. That they would have folded the handkerchief. So they, they, they picked up something, but they, didn't, but they didn't quite know what it was. Which takes us to verse 7. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the wind cloths, but folded together and placed by itself. Then the other disciple, who come to the tomb first, speaking to John, went in also, and he saw and believed. Verse 9. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise and from the dead. Now, we pick it up then. Pick the story up right there. So they know something's up, but they don't know the scripture yet. Christ raised from the dead. And it, it leads me to wonder, did they not know the scripture? Did they not understand the scripture? That is my question. Okay, did they not understand it? Because I, I believe it. Because, you know, it says, you know, three days, the, the, the temple will be torn down in three days it will be built again. But they were so just, you know, the, the next verse even goes on a little bit farther. It just makes me think how muddled and confused they were. All right? Then the disciples went away again to their own house. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stood down and looked into the tomb. They were so distracted, they left Mary Magdalene sitting there by the, by the edge of the tomb weeping. 
It never says that they counseled her. It says they went on to their own homes. All right? Can you imagine that conversation they were having on the way back down that road? That'd be one for the ages. Well, what do you think happened? Well, I don't know. Well, I, I know this. And they were, I, I believe they were confused. I think they were so confused that they forgot all about poor old Mary sitting there. You know, just weeping and, you know, just at a loss. And they just walked away and went back home. Because they didn't know. They knew what their hearts were. What scripture not yet, they didn't fully understand. I believe John, because it says he believed. I believed at that point that John believed that the fact that Christ had risen. He didn't understand the true meaning of it. Oh yeah, this is where my notes get a little murky because during the study of this tragedy, this tragedy and calamity happened in my house. All right. Now I paid all this money to do it. Part of those baseball games on my television and short circuited and went out. I once again I lost focus and was bewildered. And now I have to pick up my studies. So, so if I seem a little slow in this part, there's your reason why. <laughs> but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she taught, saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and another at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So Mary is distraught. She looks in the tomb. These two angels sit there. Now Luke it says she was, you know, there is fear that, you know, they, you know, that she was afraid, and the angels told her to be at peace. And then asked her, Who are you looking for? And at this time her focus was on the Lord. This time her focus was on the Lord. It wasn't on the two angels. She was bold with the angels and said, I'm looking for my Lord. I'm looking for Jesus. Still, even with the angels' presence there, thinking man had taken him away, I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she has said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And did not know that it was Jesus. This, this struck me really hard. Because so many times in my life. I have stood next to Jesus. I have lost focus. And I got stuck in the earthly vision of Jesus. And I forgot the supernatural. And I forgot that he was standing next to me. I can think of many evident instances in my life. Where I was standing face to face with Jesus. And did not know him. How many times in my life. In my past life before salvation. Before salvation, that Jesus worked miracles in my life, and I stood there face to face seeing the miracles he worked, but I failed to recognize him as the power of the Almighty God, of our living Savior, Jesus Christ. How many times did I fail to recognize him? Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Now, of course, this is something I had to call Steve on. All right? My thoughts, my earthly thoughts, not being focused on the spiritual. I said, well, how could she, you know, spend the last three years with Jesus and not know who he was? The simple fact is when Jesus rose from the dead, he was divine. He was all God and man body. All right. 
Do you think it would have changed some? Do you think our body, when we reach heaven, is going to be the same as it is here? No. Amen. Amen. But he still retained the wounds. Okay? Still retained the wounds. Then Christ said, by the well, there is no problem about it. God, I, I really want you to think about this. Really think about this. What did Christ say to marry her? To make her recognize her? Mary. Think about this, guys. I seriously want you to think about it because it brought tears to my eyes when I thought about it. When the day comes I meet my Lord and I stand there face to face he puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Jeff, do you think there will ever be a noise, a sound more beautiful than Christ's voice? Ever. Can you think of anything more beautiful? The hope of salvation has been secured and you're looking at dead in the face. That promise has been fulfilled. What would be your action? Do you think you're going to stand there and say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> My name's Jeff. Good to meet you. No, man. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to pull on his feet. I'm going to grab my arms around him and say, thank you. Thank you for being my Lord. Well, thank you for allowing me to serve you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for all you have given me. And at that time, Mary reached out to him. I'm sure he embraced her. All right? We're going to pick it up here. Jesus said to her, Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said, Mary. She returned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And Jesus said, Do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brother and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Now, see, when I first read that, I got a little confused. I was like, well, I guess Jesus don't want Mary to touch him because she doesn't want to soil. And then I came to the realization, we can't soil Christ. And we can't do it. Just like we cannot put him on the cross and put him to death. We don't have, humans don't have that power. We have no power over God. God has power over us. Alright? If Christ didn't want himself sacrificed on that cross, if he didn't want to make, willingly make that sacrifice, it would never have happened. Mary couldn't soil Christ. It was because when she said, Teacher, she fell and she grabbed and she did not want to let go. Isn't that like us during to get salvation? Isn't that like us with salvation? When we start learning about Christ, we grab and we want don't want to let go. We want more. And he gives us more. You know what? Well, while I was reading this, I was reading about something. There's a theologian I like. His name is David Cusick. And, uh, you know, he put a very simple analogy on the whole crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, and, and I really like the analogy. You know, Christ was hanging on the cross. 
He said, it is. It's finished. It is finished. Now, I always thought, once again, it's a mistake I had made. Miscomprehension of the words of the Bible. I thought he was speaking of his life, but he wasn't. He was talking about the job that he was sent here on earth to do. The job that he willingly came here to earth to do. He wasn't speaking about his mortal life. He was speaking about taking the sins, our sins, on his shoulders and dying for him. It is finished. I have completed my task. It is done. And your debt has been paid in full. Right there. Stand. The resurrection is the receipt. So when Satan starts telling us we're going to burn hell for our sins, God doesn't want us. When Satan starts whispering, Whisper lies. We can pull that receipt out and say, no, it is paid for. Here is the receipt. Christ has risen, and he has risen indeed, and he has risen for you and for me. I get to serve the Lord today. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Victory over death is sealed. It is done. It has been accomplished. And we have won. Christ has won. We don't have to face death. Our mortal death here on earth is just a gateway to eternal life in heaven. Thanks be to God and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.